you. Okay, so um, we, we've shared a lot with you all, and um, I wanted to just pause and engage the panelists. Um, I, I just want to hearken back to Paul's because it was such a nice overarching frame, and he left us with um, really thinking about being more attentive to community dynamics, to drive strategic decisions, make sure we prioritize measuring community power, make sure that we really focus on relational qualities of both power building and community change, and then finally, making sure that we examine longitudinal multi-level relationships. And so I'm um, just curious in terms of what are you hearing that that's connecting to each other and provoking your thinking? I'll jump in here real quickly, but I, I think clearly a thread that went through what all of us shared was, uh, the nuance and complexity and uh, sophisticated practice on the ground, really listening to people, thinking relationally, that uh, everybody talked about those dynamics. And I think that that's really important. And we all kind of understand that, but I think as researchers investing in that in deeper ways and through some of the methods that people articulated here, will really help us get a much better handle on how power really is developed and, and how it gets manifested. Great, thank you, Paul. I also heard a lot about a touch the context and being context rich. And that's one of the hardest things as evaluators or researchers to capture. And so um, uh, that's something that I wonder if um, you all have thought about just in terms of the work that you're doing. So um, can I share something? So a lot of the work that we did in our um, work in, in New Mexico with the CBPR model, I also have a I used it in Nicaragua. I used to work there. But what really seems to help people implement it is that we do have a little checklist and guide that goes with how to implement the model. So those simple things like, did you do a simple thing like do a MOU that gives more of the money to, to the community, you know? Um, you know, where are the resources going, you know, how are your actual staff, like we, we look at our staff to see, you know, do they have cultural humility, are they uh, engaging in partnering practices, and we have a list of partnering practices that people can learn and like use, so that it's not just about, you know, the actual intervention, but it's like how we as staff are interacting with people for building and supporting those relationships, so uh, those, those kind of things have helped us to have like a context checklist, a partnership, a program checklist, and an outcome checklist. Interesting. Yep. And then again, that emphasis on relationship as mm -hmm. well as the context. Great. Yeah, I think one of the things that um, I find fascinating and also like you know, tear your hair out about this um, work for as an evaluator and, pers and person doing this kind of stuff is that um, one of the context things that, that's fundamentally true is that none of this work is new because of an initiative like BHC or because you're studying it. Like this is work that has been going on in communities um, for a very long time. And so one of the pieces of context is to understand, like as you study it, like how do you begin to, to think about what you're measuring as this continuum of work that's been happening in the community for a long time versus some discrete, we're used to measuring discrete efforts that have like a you know, something came in and changed. And that's not really what this looks like. Like this, this, there may be amplification effects and other things that are created by an initiative like BHC, but it's not creating new work. It's work that communities have been doing forever. Um, so I think that's a really uh, puzzling challenge and a very uh, intriguing one for us to think about how, how we address. Thank you. And I think that's really true in terms of documenting what exists before and what can be organically built upon and then what's going to be sustained and lasting well beyond the funders of interest. And, and just because we know a lot of um, funders pivot from those kinds of um, endeavors. And I just want to link it to what Tia said earlier, just in terms of flipping the script and really emphasizing the funder role and not thinking about grass tops and funder driven types of initiatives, but building upon what's there and really nurturing that self organizing aspect. Teresa, you like you about to jump in. Uh, I was just going to add to to what Bill was saying too, in terms of evaluation and in, in the Memphis work, I was an embedded researcher, but I was really part of the, the whole team that was integrated from the community side, the health system side. Um, and I, I showed up to all events. I helped develop, you know, celebratory 
celebratory services, worship events. I was there from the very beginning. I didn't show up just for photo ops. This is one of the things the pastor said to us all the time. Don't just show up when somebody has a camera or media is shining on you. Be there for the long run. So it is very relational, but I think in terms of evaluation and building trust, that's really critical too. Yeah, and not only that, um, that actually is a great point, Teresa, because it um, that makes me also think about all the things Paul called out <clears throat> about how um, we need to approach this work and the relational aspects and the dynamics of, of how the work is happening. And in the absence of that role of an embedded evaluator that you described, it ends up looking like archaeology, like you're going back to try to piece together stuff from some outside perspective. And um, and sometimes even, you know, some of the BAC work has felt like that uh, because we're trying to piece together what happened. But if you think about this from the front and embed, if we embed ourselves as evaluators in the work, then you avoid that sort of um, reconstruction, which inevitably creates translational issues or just incomplete picture of what, what actually happened. Any other, any other comments and reaction? Okay. Um, okay, and then um, I was gonna say, um, in terms of some of the other things that I heard, um, the, the the notion being open to really evolving theories of change. I love how uh, Tia pointed out that we didn't come up with our theory of change until I think about 2013 and our North Star goals and indicators around really centering power as an end in itself, not just as a means, actually until 2017. And so we as a foundation really came in in a very adaptive learning mode and it comes from being responsive to community. So just curious in terms of not being wedded to a specific framework or a theory of change to evaluate intervention or outcomes all throughout, if you have comments around that. Tia, would you like to jump in because you're nodding vigorously? Yeah, it can it can be really frustrating from the perspective of like the consultant or the evaluator trying to do it. But like once you roll with it, once you realize that like, I think it's what Bill said, just like this work has been going on for, you know, hundreds of years really around power building and resistance and survival. Um, and and that that it needs to constantly be improving, right? That it's not the distinct intervention that has a beginning and an end and a really well defined program model, and you can assess fidelity. It's not like that. So you you know you have to be willing to just wade into the messiness and find that like the lack of clarity also is. There's always it's what 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 Paul said. It's a dialectic between. It's frustrating not to have this clarity and very linear theory of change and measures. And it's also really powerful because you have to wade into complexity and you get better at trying to capture what actually is going on. Thank you. And um, I, I see Bill nodding because I think he and his team reviewed no less than 1400 documents trying to piece it all together when they came in to try to evaluate BHC in the last several years. Laura, mm -hmm. you're unmuted. Did you want to jump in? Oh, or? I'm sorry. Yeah. I, didn't, I just, I think I just lost it there. But okay, no. great. Um, I mean, I, I think that one of the things that I like about all of the presentations is that like the flexibility of, you know, of trying to address power, you know, in, in all its different forms. And um, what I really like, I mean, of, about that, the CBPR model for our, our work was is that we could use it as a planning tool, evaluation tool, <laughs> and, a, and a reflection tool, right? So that there's always that dialectical process. Like I do think the power piece is like you do power, you know, your power with, right? You you are learning just as much as the people experiencing homelessness and your community. And so just that whole praxis of listening, dialogue, taking action. And I think, you know, especially in that COVID environment where things were moving so fast, like you were inside the shelter, you all were there together. And you just had to like keep on figuring out what to do over and over again in a reflective cycle. Just that being inside that cycle together with the team inside the shelter built trust, you know, and, and the empowerment that you saw, like I actually had to leave to go to another job, but they're all just doing, they're doing great. Like, because, you know, everyone had already had really clear outcomes for what they all want that we all were working towards. Does that make sense? I just, was like really showed like how important that community priority piece was like defining that as a team and then everyone contributing pieces to that. Yeah, Laura, thank you so much. And I think your presentation as well as Teresa really illustrate what it means to be in practice as embedded evaluators and doing power with. 
type of uh, research and evaluation. Bill, it sounds like you were about to jump in, and then I, I'm beginning to see questions pour in. So please uh, put your um, questions in the chat box, and then we'll turn to that after. Um, yeah, no, I'm ready for questions. Okay, I know one of them is for you, actually, <laughs> so oh, okay. get ready. Um, but the first one is a, a question around confidentiality, actually. Uh, someone asked, how, how do we support these kinds of, I assume, research efforts over time and protect communities of color when data is used to tip off the opposition from the strategic and covert long game efforts of the oppressor? You know, I immediately thought about that in terms of the network survey that we've been developing and how careful we are to protect confidentiality. I wonder if you want to say a little bit about that, though. Yeah, I think that's actually a great example. And we've we've actually had that very conversation as part of that. So we have this part of the part of the you know the BHC evaluation work is um, you know I, I presented what we're doing, but it's a huge ecosystem of people working on this. And one of the things happening under all of that connected work is this survey of the community organizations and partners that are um, part of that power building network, that ecosystem of organizations. And we're collecting a lot of information that we're hoping to use to help support and build and weave that network together. But it's also information that would be incredibly valuable to somebody with ill intentions for what that network is trying to achieve. Um, so we've actually had a lot, very conversation a lot about what can we put out in the world. We want transparency and we all sort of want to create something that is a shared community asset, but there are also risks with that kind of like transparency as well. I think it's been a real struggle. We've had to really think about what we what we make available and what we don't and um, and what can what the sort of sec unintended consequences of that can be. And I think that that's a really fantastic question that was raised that I think um, raises a lot about your responsibility when you try to create a learning system for what the con like what the consequences of creating a learning engine are. And sometimes that's a positive thing to help build with and sometimes there's always the potential that it can be used to destroy too. Right. Yeah. And I think we, we build these so that it's in service of strategy for um, power builders. And so thinking about how to mm -hmm. really use that to support them, but not tip off the opposition. So I think that's really critical. Um, there's a question for you, Laura. Um, so I'll turn to you next. The question is, any tips on getting community perspective without physically being in community? So um, the person who asked this said, we're doing a modified remote CBPR approach for a place-based intervention, but are feeling limited in what we can do without being physically present. I just wonder if they have Zoom or like internet connectivity. Um, we were like, obviously in the shelter, we couldn't be there because people didn't even have phones. I mean, we had to be there physically. But um, I know that we have been working on other projects with health councils and we do it via Zoom. And uh, there's a lot of like community building activities you can do on Zoom and, you know, build, start building trust. So that's a lot of the work we've been doing right now with health councils, primarily my colleagues are doing a lot of work with using CBPR with, uh, you know, Zoom platform, but obviously it would be nicer to be on real life. But um, we've done things like, I don't know if you've used Jamboard, but um, we use the Jamboard, which is like a digital whiteboard. So we were able to do things like do the um, CBPR model, like planning and visioning guide on, um, on digital. And it worked really, really well, so. Yeah, and I know as a researcher who really wanted to be in community as much as I could, it, there are constraints of geography, resource, time, but so critical in building trust and relationship. And so in some ways, um, COVID forcing us uh, onto video conferencing is making people interface in a very different way, but there is the digital divide just in terms of how to make sure that there is that kind of access for communities. Thank you, Laura, that was really helpful. Okay, and then I'm gonna go back to Bill. There's a question about, can you share more about the emerging platform for open source, collective action learning. What are some design features, important elements of infrastructure, and how close is it to becoming real? <laughs> yeah. Um, so what we've really focused on doing is um, rather than create um, sort of uh, an evaluation, we're trying to create this, what, what I described as a learning engine. And so you know, all of the work it has taken, you know, honestly, a couple of years of work just to kind of start building this connected sort of analytic engine and data ecosystem. Um, and what we're hoping to be able to do is create sort of a catalog of what's available and how it's connected and then 
um, obviously working in partnership with TCE, invite other um, partners into that ecosystem to uh, take advantage of that. And so the kind of capabilities that we're hoping it'll happen is that we have, you know, we've built out all of this data, we've developed this sort of universal coding and connecting system. And so you might be able to sort of approach with a, a specific question of interest and easily be able to sort through that to identify the data elements along each of those different dimensions that would be the most applicable to whatever the work is you're trying to do to contribute to the knowledge that this ecosystem is designed to create um, and then extract those um, probably with some sort of, you know, process uh, where we they're vetted to see what, we, what we're allowed to share and all of that sort of stuff, um, especially in the light of the question that was asked earlier about uh, the ways you can use information either to help or hinder efforts. Um, but given given all of that, the idea would be that this would become sort of a, a repository that um, lots of smart thinkers and researchers who want to kind of advance this work can, can take advantage of, because it's taken a ton of effort to build it. And one of the things that I think is underappreciated about BHC because it's so many communities and it's, and local control has played such a strong role in that evolution that Tia described. You know, when you really think about it, so much stuff got tried. Like this is like a huge laboratory of innovation that just happened. Um, and we can, there's so much to learn about from all of those things that we could never, no one researcher could ever tap into all of that. So we really need to get a lot of minds on this and make, make it available to as many people as we can to, to figure out what we can learn from all of that. Great. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, I'll have the last question to TC, Teresa. Um, someone was interested in the Memphis model in that it has had such impressive results and the underlying causes seem quite clear. To what extent has that kind of power building continued in Memphis and or be, been taken up elsewhere? What challenges stand in the way of a wider diffusion? And we have about a couple minutes left. <laughs> so I don't know. It's a big question. <laughs> Um, well, I, I left Memphis several years ago and then went North Carolina now. And um, I will say that I, that some of the disparities have changed um, in terms of uh, community building. I know there's some some efforts that have gone on since I've left town. Um, I think the Congregational Health Network itself has, has kind of gone into a more latent period because of leadership changes, quite frankly. Um, and I think that's a negative signal to the community in terms of community power. Um, but the faith communities will persist. And that's one of the issues in terms of faith community partnerships is they have, they've endured for hundreds of years and they're going to continue to endure no matter whether we have COVID or there's a new CEO or whatever. Um, and I think there's also issues in, in terms of uh, power opening space for leadership. I think certain leaders are more open um, to having those flat and horizontal power differentials, kind of flattening that and saying community power is really important. Community intelligence and agency and capacity is really important. And some are not so invested in that. And uh, I think that uh, there were leaders when we were there um, doing this work that really intentionally held that space open for people and community to come to leverage that power and to, to get into that space that I'm not sure that that's going on now. Now, I will say that, for example, infant mortality in 2007 in Memphis was the incidence for African-American babies was an, of infant mortality was the same as Zimbabwe. <laughs> And that's that has improved a lot, I'm happy to say. So the, the work continues. Um, but I think the leadership, both on the health system side as well as on the community side, makes a big difference in how that is manifested or played out. And Thanks. that probably would require two more workshops to answer more <laughs> adequately. <laughs> and I'm glad you said that. Um, I see Carla popping on. Um, I just want to thank each and every one of you for accepting to be part of this. I knew I would get so much out of it. I was pretty selfish in organizing this and I I, I think it just delivered. And so um, I want to tease you by saying the California Endowment is organizing this thing we call the Power Mind Meld, which really signals that so much has happened within the last few years. The work of USCEIR, work of Hari Han, Paul and his team, and then all of our constellation of evaluators. So I hope this will be just the beginning of a series of very deep, exciting conversations. And I um, just want to really thank you for taking part and everyone else out there for um, taking part in this workshop. Okay, thank you. And I'll head it to Carla.